I recently received a cable from the internet. That's where you get cables. And it's a pretty strange one. Uh, it adapts from DB25 to SCART. And while a lot of people watching will be familiar with one or both of these separately, this specific combination will probably make little sense to most of you. Uh, I got this one from retrogamingcables.co.uk and there's a good chance you've all done business with them, what with the explosion of interest in retro gaming in the last 10 to 15 years. Retro gaming, of course, is the term for playing decades old video games from the NES, PlayStation, etc. And usually when people get into this nowadays, they don't just buy a Sega Genesis and an old TV and plug them together with a plain old composite video cable like most people did back when those systems were new. Instead, almost everyone sets them up right off the jump for pure RGB video output, since it's sharper, cleaner, and the colors are usually more intense. Now, Nobody did this in at least Japan or the US when these systems were new. The standard connections for game consoles and all other video gear uh, was NTSC composite video. And in fact, the original Famicom didn't even have a composite output until they released the updated NES a decade later. So it's not terribly authentic, arguably, to play games over RGB, and if you wanted to be pedantic, the way the designers intended them to be seen was over an antenna input with your TV tuned to channel 3 or whatever, but that's an argument for another time. The point is, everyone wants RGB now, and who's surprised? Even if you did play games over composite back in the day, or even over an RF cable, it's pretty impressive to see them again with sharp pixels and fully saturated colors. And if you got your start with old games on emulators, then that's what you're gonna be used to anyway. But first, you have to get the picture out of the console somehow, and that's where aftermarket video cables come in. While a few consoles need to be modded to output RGB, like the NES, a lot of them actually do it already. You just need the right kind of cable. And for the most part, those were never sold in North America since none of our TVs had RGB inputs. Uh, it's a curious thing, but despite televisions all having red, green, and blue pixels and using those signals internally, virtually no consumer set ever sold in the US could accept a signal in that format. They took composite or S-video and the very late ones took component, but that's it. And most people never used anything besides composite because most equipment never supported it. And that's why over the last couple decades, the market for used professional televisions has been absolutely devoured by American retro gamers. Sony PVMs are the front runners in retro gaming displays. They made millions of these, but they've been so overfished at this point that a little eight inch job like this will run you about 250 bucks on a really good day. And one big enough to actually see from your couch will often set you back more than a 65 inch LG C2 OLED. But people will still often pay these prices because in addition to looking fantastic as CRTs go, almost all of these also support RGB, like here red, green, blue, and sync input. So if I bought the appropriate cable, I could plug into SNES right into this thing. It'd be a little small, but it'd still look great. I'm actually not that into retro gaming on real hardware, however. I'm mostly an emulator jerk uh, when it comes to games, so I don't have a console collection. My girlfriend has them all, but she can keep them. For my part, I'm more into home computers. I have a decent set of them. Um, I've got a Commodore 64, several Apple IIs, a ZX Spectrum, an Amstrad CPC, uh, and a few others, including this Atari 8-bit machine, for instance. This is one of my favorites. Uh, a thing about all of them, though, is that they all benefit from a really good monitor. Computers, um, more often than game consoles, dealt with a lot of text. Uh, you usually had to program them yourself in those days, so you need to be able to clearly make out a display full of basic code. And productivity applications uh, wanted to cram as much information onto the screen as possible. This was a problem because home computers were generally designed to use standard consumer televisions for displays, not custom purpose-built monitors, not even anything this good. Standard definition isn't really fantastic for displaying dense screenfuls of text at its best, and most people didn't get it at its best. Televisions were often not nearly as good as a PVM, to say the least, and some of the computers weren't all that hot either. Uh, the ZX Spectrum was probably at the worst end of the um, spectrum, since it only supported RF. You had to tune your TV to channel three or whatever they used in the UK. And even at its best, it really didn't look all that legible. And most people didn't see it at its best. But even the machines at the opposite end of the gradient uh, didn't do all that hot. Um, the Atari 8-bit and the Commodore 64, for instance, uh, are the only machines I'm aware of that could output separate luminance and chrominance signals, uh, what we would start calling in the 90s S-video. 
uh, but I don't know how many monitors were available that actually supported that, uh, given that this machine came out in 1979. So I imagine most people uh, on this machine, and even with the Commodore 64, were probably limited to just plain old composite. So if you're starting out in a bad position already, uh, to get the best performance, you really want the best possible display because even if composite sucks, a really high quality television can dig a little more quality out of it versus some junky $150 Walmart special or whatever the equivalent was in 1989. Nowadays, of course, the PVM is probably your best bet. These things are spoken of in hushed tones in most circles, uh, as if they can perform miracles, and to be honest, they kinda can. Even with a composite input, this PVM can make something readable out of the Atari 800's video output, which is pretty impressive, honestly. And if I could haul my 20 inch in here from home without throwing my back out, I could show you that it does even better. You'd almost think you weren't looking at composite at all. The S video input is even better. It hardly looks like a normal TV signal. You'd almost think it was RGB. But really, you just wish it really was. That's what all computers should have used, all of them, forever. Text benefits from a sharp picture, and RGB is how you get that. Every TV internally supports it, and it's absurd that we made anything that output composite at all if it wasn't intended to be broadcast over the airwaves. If every home computer had just demanded an RGB monitor, everyone would have been happier. But of course, uh, this is all just wishful thinking. Except that in other places it wasn't. Europe, in particular, apparently had a ton of TVs and monitors that supported RGB input, and I think that's largely because they already had a connector for it. Uh, the US didn't use RGB, so we didn't have any standard interface for it, but Europe had this thing called SCART, a term which probably didn't sound nearly as bad in France where it was invented. SCART was a standard that put composite, RGB, and audio signals going two directions all into a single plug. So your TV and VCR didn't need a half dozen cables strung between them for playback or even recording. This became universal throughout Europe, and since it included the RGB signal lines from the get-go, it made sense for manufacturers of TVs to hook those up. And as a result, uh, some European consoles and home computers supported them, because they were there. If you're using RGB internally for everything, then why speak composite at all? And if anyone in North America had been reasonable about that, then none of this crap ever would have existed. We wouldn't need to worry about S-Video component or any of it. We just would have done it right from the get-go. So this means that there are a number of home computers uh, from the UK, including the Amstrad CPC and even the later ZX Spectrums, ironically, uh, that actually have clean RGB output. And since I have some of those machines, there's value in owning a monitor with RGB inputs, but um, an 8-inch PVM might be passable for gaming, but it really doesn't cut it for a computer. It may do a remarkable job of displaying text for what it is, but actually reading a screen full of text at these dimensions is murder on your eyes. And even if you're lucky enough to have a 14 or 20 inch tube, the problem is that they're pretty much just scaled up versions of this thing, a great big gray cube that takes up two thirds of your desk. They might have a great picture, but they don't look the part at all, and they're far from the intended use case. This is not what's supposed to plug into this. And this is not what's supposed to plug into this. There's not much verisimilitude. So I had been on the lookout for a better option for several years, um, and I'd seen a picture of a display that I felt would fit the bill, but it wasn't until a couple months ago that one wandered into my life. This is a Sony PVM1390, and although uh, PVM means professional video monitor, according to some people on the internet, who may or may not actually be authorities, uh, the P is somewhat exaggerated. Uh, supposedly, this is actually a Sony consumer TV set that they resold as a professional display. Uh, another variant of this even dropped the PVM terminology and added a TV tuner, so who knows how pro this necessarily was. On the other hand, I don't really know what the professional part means. To me, every Trinitron display looks fantastic. If the real ones, real, are supposed to be sharper or more color accurate or something, I wouldn't know it. And honestly, I don't really care because what's important to me about it more than anything is uh, the shape.
See, one of the problems with using a PVM as a monitor is that they sit flat. They aren't meant to be used on a desk, they're meant to be installed into a video editing bay or a TV control room, where they'll be mounted at whatever angle works best. If you have one sitting in front of you, well, you'll be staring down at it, unless you prop it up on some phone books. I don't even know who has a phone book anymore, and even if you do that, it just looks like crap having it sitting on some crap. The 1390, however, was sold as a computer monitor. It's meant to sit on a desk, so it's tilted up a little. You can comfortably look down at it. It's subtle, but it makes a big difference. And uh, more importantly, it just looks right. It doesn't look like a fish out of water. It looks like something you'd plop on top of an IBM PC. And hey, let's talk about that. The PVMs are famous for their RGB input support, and sure enough, this one has it too. That's what this funky cable that I bought is for. But most models, as I showed you, use four separate BNC inputs. That's really intended for studio applications though, because you're going to have four separate cables between your devices. Obviously, if you're plugging in a PC, you'd prefer a single cable, and that's exactly how Sony set this up. All the connectors for this thing are on the side, which is an interesting decision. You'd think they would be on the back. Now, that's actually really convenient for me, but I don't know if that's why Sony designed it this way. Putting the connectors on the back is great for a studio situation where you've got something installed into a system. All the cables come in the back and stay there uh, for a very, very long time. You don't need to get at them. But if you do need to get at them, even if it's on a desktop, it's irritating getting behind the thing all the time. So if you're swapping cables out constantly, this is actually a much more convenient position for them. And I wonder if that's what Sony intended. Now for inputs, uh, the first one is composite because of course some home computers had only composite outputs, so we've got something for everybody here. The next one is S-Video, which would work great with your C64, your Atari 800, etc. We also have a VTR input on here. Now that was a Sony invention. They started using it in I think the mid 60s on their early videotape recorders and then continued uh, well up into the 80s and possibly 90s on their pro level equipment. It's, uh, I think, sort of a mini SCART, uh, as it were. It has audio and video, I believe, uh, although probably only in one direction. And it's kind of a bummer that we didn't make it a de facto standard here in the US for plugging things in. It would have beat using a whole pile of RCA cables, but since we never make good decisions, that didn't happen. But the input I'm excited about is this one right here, the computer, or as the label says, computer. This actually has sync on green, which a few people in the audience are going nuts about right now, but mostly it's just a single connector that carries RGB, sync, and audio all in one, assuming you have the right cable, like I do now. Naturally, that's uh, what this guy was about. This DB25 connector uh, with this pinout only shows up on a couple Sony PVMs and nothing else that I'm aware of. And the other models it appears on, I think, are the more conventional gray cube variety. So this thing has both the look and it's got the inputs I want and it doesn't require me to use a whole bundle of separate cables. So this is rad, but it actually goes even further. This has specific support for a feature that I want and a lot of other people don't care about. See, the RGB input here is analog, but if you bridge the right pair of pins, the monitor switches into TTL mode. Uh, now, this is an artifact of the 80s. The first couple graphics cards for the IBM PC, as well as a few Japanese home computers that never made it over here, output RGB video, but it's not in an analog format, it's in a digital one, uh, often referred to as RGBI, because you have three color channels in the form of logic signals plus five or zero volts, nothing in between. They're just on or off. And then the I or intensity lead uh, doubles or halves the brightness of the pixel. There are ways to adapt that kind of output to work on normal RGB monitors, but it usually requires some conversion. Uh, and especially with IBM PCs, you actually have to have some specialized logic uh, to adapt for some weirdness that IBM did with the color palette. This monitor, however, has that support built in. I would just have to build the right kind of cable. Or I suppose I could try to find an original one, since Sony actually sold a cable for this purpose, as seen on the cover of the manual for the KV1311CR, the lower end version of this display that had a built-in TV tuner. You can see what I mean from the photo they used. This tube looks the part. It's clearly a computer monitor. You wouldn't go, that's a TV that they plopped on top of their PC, like you would with most readily available RGB displays and most PVMs. Now, while there were tons of PC-compatible monitors made back in the day, in my experience, they haven't 
survived all that well. Most of them seem to be in pretty terrible condition nowadays, at least dusty, um, often very heavily yellowed. Uh, and a lot of them have been very clearly been left in a shed for a long time. Now, I recently got a nearly mint condition IBM PC, so I don't want a crusty shed find eyesore sitting on top of it. This monitor, however, would be a perfect match. I haven't gotten the parts for that yet, otherwise I'd be showing it to you right now, but uh, it just goes to illustrate how useful this particular PBM is for my specific needs. I think most people wouldn't get that much benefit from this particular device. Uh, if you're just retro gaming, you'd probably be happier with the more typical models because you wouldn't have to chase down this DB25 connector. Uh, but for computer use, this thing is really cool. And you know, it seems like kind of a, a petty thing to get excited about, but this has a built-in speaker under the display, which most PVMs have, but it's usually off to one side, which makes it really awkward to listen to because the audio will be coming out into one ear or the other. It's really only meant to be used to check if there's sound at all. You're supposed to have other monitoring speakers or headphones. This one puts it right in the center because it's not for that purpose. You're actually supposed to listen to it. So this is kind of perfect for my needs. Uh, and fortunately, the video quality doesn't suffer uh, for all these features. Let's take a look. First up, here's the Atari 8-bit again, and it looks just as good or better than it did on that tiny PVM, even over composite. Uh, and it looks even better over S-Video. And my favorite part about this monitor is uh, the S-Video and composite inputs are parallel, so you can switch directly between them. So on a machine like this that supports that, you can do these wonderful side-by-side -side comparisons. Uh, there's not that many displays that'll do that without uh, a long channel switching pause. This one just goes straight from one to the other. I love it. And while I am focusing on text here, uh, let's see what a video game looks like anyway, while we're here. Zaxxon is a pretty good test title for older computers and uh, home video game systems uh, since it was a pretty early arcade game, so pretty much anything can render a decent facsimile of it, unless you go all the way back to like the Atari 2600. This one isn't doing so hot, but I don't think it's the monitor's fault. As you can see, even over S-Video, all the pixels still look incredibly crisp. There's a little bit more interference than you get over pure RGB, but given that this platform never had that as far as I know, this is pretty impressive stuff. And to be fair, it does look a bit better than the treatment Xevious got. Next up, I've got one of those British home computers I mentioned. This is an Amstrad CPC 464, a remarkably well-designed machine, all things considered, uh, which included RGB all the way back in 1984. One thing I like about the CPC is that they chose to make their basic interpreter yellow on blue by default, so it's extra contrasty, and it looks brilliant on this display. By the way, I'm sorry for the flicker. That's happening because this is a PAL region machine. So it's actually outputting a 50 hertz picture, uh, which illustrates another great thing about these monitors. They're multi-standard. Um, I don't know if this will do CCAM, but that's pretty dang rare. NTSC and PAL, however, come up fairly frequently in my life. So that's an extra bonus. Now, I'd love to load up a game on here, but the tapes for these machines weren't too reliable when they were new, and uh, nowadays I'm having a hard time getting any of them to load. Fortunately, however, home computers of the 80s could all be programmed without any extra software. So here's a little basic program I whipped up. And you can't get much clearer than that without emulating on your PC. Speaking of PCs, however, what would one look like on here? Like I said, I don't have the RGB adapter cable, but we can still hook one up over a composite. It'll look terrible, but we'll see how it does anyway. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty rough. Nothing can save the IBM CGA's composite output from itself, I think. Um, this machine isn't even an original PC. This is four or five years newer. This is a Tandy 1000 uh, with far more advanced graphics than the PC had. So I think if anything was going to look passable, it would be this. And it really just doesn't cut it. Now, if we lower the saturation so it's black and white, it looks considerably better. Much of the problem uh, is that the PC's video output is very sloppy. So the uh, luminance information is being interpreted as color information, but you know, you shouldn't need to do that uh, to make this work. And even in black and white, it looks pretty rough still. I mean, look, is that an M or an N or a K? Uh, it's actually an H. You'd never guess it. 
Now, I'd love to say that uh, it looks bad in text mode, but does a lot better in video games, but unfortunately, that's not true either. This is Bruce Lee, one of my preferred composite uh, video game test programs, and uh, yeah, it's still um, pretty shockingly rough. It, it looks just really, really bad. The CGA was not designed for composite output. That's something they stuffed in at the last second, as far as I can tell, because it barely works, even compared uh, to some other contemporary machines. So uh, there really is no clawing CGA composite back from hell, uh, which is why I'm particularly excited to finally get an RGB display uh, that'll look good on top of my various PCs, uh, so I never have to struggle with this again. And, you know, I could spend another hour going through different machines that I've got, but you get the picture, uh, pun intended. This display looks great. But now, let's see how it does with another machine, one that it was probably specifically designed for. One of my favorite things about collecting 8-bit computers is that they all fit in these flat stair light boxes. It's very convenient for stacking. Now, this is not one of the machines that I mentioned earlier. This is a Japanese domestic design, which I picked because it's exactly the kind of thing Sony sold this monitor to be used with. See, here's an ad uh, for this monitor, and the machine it's sitting on top of is an MSX computer. The one I have in this box is also an MSX, and it's even a Sony as well, but you might not realize it at a glance. This one looks pretty different, from that one, but that was kind of what the MSX was all about. If you're from the US or even the EU, you might not be familiar with these computers. They've been sort of lost to time and they were never all that big outside of Japan. And I admit, I'd love to get into that topic really deep right now, but it's a whole two hour video on its own. So here's the cliff notes. The MSX wasn't a single computer made by one company. It was a standard developed in 1983 as a collaboration between Microsoft and Matt Sashita, uh, who you might know better as Panasonic. It defined the specs for software and hardware compatibility, so it's sort of like the IBM PC clone market, except that they intended for it to happen. Uh, there were machines uh, based on the MSX spec made by dozens of manufacturers in all different countries uh, for over a decade. Uh, I've got a couple of them. I've got the Sony here, and then I've got this uh, tiny Casio, uh, and I also have a Yamaha, and all three are completely different in design and capabilities. To give you an idea how wildly these vary, this machine, and this machine can run much of the same software. There are actually two different generations, uh, MSX and MSX2, uh, but Midnight Building here will run just fine in the Hitbit. So if you wanted to collect these, there are actually uh, literally hundreds of models, uh, and I think it's one of the coolest phenomena in the history of home computers. Uh, there were actually several other popular home computers in Japan at the same time, uh, Sharps X1, the Fujitsu FM7, and the NEC PC88, which I've wanted to collect as well, but they're more complicated to use. They're harder to get a hold of over here. These things are just um, nice little compact machines. They don't have a bunch of separate parts. So I've just had my fingers crossed that one of those other machines will fall into my lap for about five years. But MSXs are fun and convenient to collect, if you have the money to import them anyway. I didn't, but I bought three anyway. See, a problem with those other machines, they're a lot more dependent on floppy disks or tapes. The MSX, on the other hand, um, mostly had its software on cartridges, just like a game console. And like any other game console, you can now buy cartridges that let you put virtually the entire software library on a single SD card. So I can just pop this in the top here and run just about any game I like. But another neat thing about the MSX is that they were one of the few home computers that had built-in expansion slots in addition to the one you put the game in. Uh, there were other uh, home computers like the ZX Spectrum where you could plug something into the cartridge slot, but usually just one thing. This machine has a slot on the back as well, and you could plug a variety of hardware add-ons in there. In fact, some machines had three or four slots. So, for instance, um, most games on here take advantage of the MSX's built-in three-voice sound generator, but there are some games that can take advantage of one of these, an FM pack. Uh, this puts a Yamaha FM sound chip uh, in the machine, much like uh, what the Sega Genesis used, and any game with support can detect it if I just plug it in the back here. <clears throat> God, that's a really tight port. Uh, these features, like uh, multiple cartridge slots, were standardized, but some manufacturers added special features as well. The Sony here in particular is the only MSX I have with RGB output. 
And of course, the retro gaming community being what it is, I was able to buy a cable in like the 2010s to adapt this out to start so we can plug it in to our monitor here. One other fun thing about this machine, uh, since it's from Japan, it's not designed for 115 volt input, it's designed for 100. And while you can put the higher US voltage into it, it gets uncomfortably hot. Uh, it's not a great idea. So I bought the funniest step down transformer, one that just drops 15 volts off the input. So I'm almost ready here. I uh, just need to plug my SCART cables together here. But while SCART does carry audio, for some reason this cable is not pinned out to tell the monitor to look for that audio through the DB25. Fortunately, it breaks the sound out into RCAs, which I can just plug in to input B here, and now I'm set. This is Vampire Killer. No, not Castlevania. This is the other game that Konami made at the same time that's sort of like an alternate universe take on Castlevania. I won't cover it in depth. Other people have done a much better job, but it's something more like an action RPG mixed with a puzzle game rather than Castlevania's hardcore action approach. I highly recommend checking it out if you've never seen it before. But this is a hell of a way to see it. Like I said, this display is just as crisp as any PVM, but also, like I said, video games are easy mode. Let's see what this thing looks like as a computer. And now you can see what I mean. This really is a computer interface. Uh, this is running a knockoff of Midnight Commander, I think, called MM. And I'm not sure the pixel resolution here, but just look at how crisp this text is. You really couldn't ask for a clearer picture than this. I mean, I don't know exactly how many characters this is fitting on the screen, but it sure looks like an 80 column display, which was sort of the holy grail of 80s computing for a while. This looks just about as good, I think, as a PC with a VGA graphics card. It's got a, a little more of the sort of scan line effect going on, but I don't think most people would notice a difference. It looks just pristine, but I think it'll make even more of an impact if we drop out of MM into DOS. And I don't mean a knockoff, I mean MS-DOS, uh, or actually MSX-DOS. Since Microsoft uh, helped create the MSX standard, they also contributed a version of MS-DOS uh, adapted for this platform. It's really weird to see this on a system that isn't even based on the Intel 8088. The MSXs all use Z80 CPUs, so as far as I know, there aren't any PC DOS programs you can run on here, but in most other regards, it's DOS as you know it, and again, it looks just fantastic on this display. So yeah, I could use my MSXs over composite if I really wanted to, but this is definitely the preferred approach. And this monitor is the most natural, comfortable, authentic way I could do it. I was really lucky to have this show up locally since even if I'd wanted to pay $500 plus shipping for one on eBay, it would have gotten destroyed on the way here for sure. It's a really bad idea to ship CRTs. Some people get away with it, I've been successful once or twice, but I also have a lot of friends who've had them arrived completely pulverized, so I don't recommend it no matter how much you want one. But if you ever see one of these at a flea market, please grab it. You won't regret it. You'll be able to find someone else who wants it, even if you don't. And that's really all I wanted to show you today. I just like this monitor. There's nothing all that spicy about it, but since you hung around this long, I wanted to take a moment and show you something cute about the MSX's history. This model happens to have a three and a half inch floppy drive, which isn't surprising since Sony invented that format. So when I ordered the machine, I also picked up this random disc that I saw on eBay, and it turned out to be an old type of publication called a disc mag, uh, literally a magazine in the form of software mailed to subscribers. Uh, this one was made by MSX Fan, uh, which is a print magazine, uh, but they made this separately. So it's sort of similar to what we'd call a cover disc. I don't speak Japanese, so I can't really give you a tour of this, but what I can appreciate is the art. A weird thing about the MSX uh, to me is that if you start it up without a cartridge, um, naturally it searches for a disc to boot from, which is very PC behavior. Makes me uncomfortable.
It starts up with this gorgeous manga title screen and this ridiculous music. It kind of sounds like farting trombones or the Decemberists' 16 military wives, uh, but it's also illustrating something I mentioned earlier. This is using my FM sound cartridge. See if I shut it off and pull it out and start it up again. Now we just get the basic built-in three voice sound and you can tell why these FM packs were popular. One interesting quirk before I go on, this is actually an alignment screen. So if I use the arrow keys, I can move the picture around and wherever I put it, it'll stay uh, once I make it to the menu. So this is apparently for calibrating your monitor. I haven't seen that much older software that did that. Anyway, here's the menu. By the way, if anybody can tell me which evolution this is, hit me up in the comments. I haven't gone through all this yet. Um, I'll probably have to make a video on my YouTube side channel where I do that someday, but usually disc mags have the same sort of things. Uh, I'm sure some of these are just, you know, general news, uh, letters to the editor, that sort of thing. Um, this is probably like a, a help column. Uh, I'm guessing these are some little mini games probably submitted by readers. Uh, and then uh, this section here, AV, are little uh, sort of audio visual demos, uh, kind of like the demo scene, but far more rudimentary. I also have no idea why there's a McDonald's logo down here, uh, but my favorite part about this is in the upper right. This one that says FM, which is just about what it sounds like. It's a bunch of uh, FM music files that you can play. Here's one. Now it's very funny to me, but I can't find a way to get back from this to the menu. I think I actually have to restart the whole machine to listen to another song, but this still gives you kind of an idea why I'm really interested in home computers, especially the ones that uh, you know people are less familiar with, at least where I live. Game consoles and video games are certainly interesting enough, and there are some real gems in the ancient history of the ColecoVision or the SG-1000, but Nothing nearly as unusual as what I've found on home computers. Um, I've explored the ZX Spectrum's software library, for instance, extensively in several dozen streams on my side channel, and I'm regularly surprised by the ideas people had for what to do with computers back in the 80s. I've known that mailing digital music around was a thing that used to happen, but it's still remarkable to me to think about. I've been on the internet for most of my life. If I wanted new music, I could usually just go download it, even if it was just midis. And still, I remember how much I appreciated the music in my NES games, like Mega Man and Castlevania, to the point where I sometimes left them paused just so I could keep listening to it. And I was excited when I got new NES games uh, because they might have really good music, and sometimes they did. I can't tell you what an effect the bizarre soundtrack of Eight Eyes had on me, even if the rest of the game was completely unplayable. It was hard to find new, good music before the MP3.com and iTunes era began. So I can only imagine how exciting it must have been before that era to receive a disc in the mail monthly or even quarterly with a bunch of songs I could play on my computer. It's wild to think about and I wish I'd been there for it. And at least by exploring some of this stuff I can feel a little bit of what it might have been like. Anyway, that's the video. I just really wanted to show you this monitor. I really like it and maybe it's the right fit for your needs too. Maybe you'll someday save one from a dumpster or an e-waste pallet, but if not, I hope you enjoyed this vicariously, at least. Uh, and if you did, consider subscribing so I know you're into this sort of thing. And remember to turn on notifications if you want to find out when I upload new videos. 
If you really enjoyed this, however, consider supporting me on Patreon like these people here are doing. It costs a lot to get stuff like this and stuff to plug into stuff like this and to afford my lights and cameras and the rent on my studio. So I'm incredibly grateful to everyone who's supporting me on there. I couldn't do this without all of them. Thank you all so much and everyone else. Thanks for watching.